Okay, this is live streamed. Got it. Also live streamed. Good. Good. Okay. We'll get started in a minute here. Is everything okay on the web? People can hear, see, hearing is okay. Hearing is okay in the back. Okay. You can fall asleep in the back. As long as you don't disrupt the lecture, you can fall asleep, of course. Uh, okay, what time is it? Oh, it's almost time. Let's give it half a minute until the clock turns and then we'll start, we'll get started. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to our third lecture. Uh, today we're going to continue combinational logic and my intent is to finish all of what I would like to cover in combinational logic. So let's hope that it happens. Uh, before that, apparently it's not working. So reminders, uh, remember you have an extra credit assignment. Uh, you can find information on this on the web page and you can submit via Moodle. Is the assignment ready, Mohammed? Okay, so you, have, you, you must have the link online somewhere and then some links on how to do reviews. I'll assign you another extra credit assignment today on a seminal paper uh, as we will discuss. Okay, some readings. Uh, I've. Uh, shown this earlier also today, we're going to cover combination logic. Tomorrow, we're going to cover sequential logic. And this is where we were in the last lecture. We started with the basic building blocks of computers and we introduced transistors and we built some logic gates out of it. I'm going to brush up on that very quickly and then we're going to build up a lot more today. We're going to build more logic gates. We're going to talk about Boolean algebra, which I understand most of you know. Uh, so we're going to go relatively quickly for the, to, uh, to get to the parts that you don't know. I believe. And then we're going to talk more about combination logic circuits, different combination logic blocks. We're going to talk about how to use Boolean algebra to represent combination logic circuits and how to use Boolean algebra simplification rules so that we can simplify logic circuits and also some other things. Does that sound exciting? Okay, cool. We're building up as you can see, right? We start with the transistor and we're going to talk a little bit about the transistors also, although I'm not going to cross the abstraction layer too much, let's say. Uh, as I said, we're going to assume transistors work. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, this is uh, just a reminder. Uh, we said that all computers uh, are based on the same building blocks, and these are some examples. We discussed this in the last lecture. I'm going to skip it. We talked about those, the major building block, which is the transistor in modern technologies. And recall that we had two types of transistors, uh, the N type and the P type, NMOS and PMOS. These are metal oxide semiconductors. And we abstracted this transistor as a logical switch, just similar to the way wall switches work. In the n-type transistor, uh, it basically acts as a piece of wire if the gate is supplied with high voltage, one, let's say. It acts as an open circuit. The wire is disconnected if the gate is supplied with a voltage of zero, logical zero value. And p-type operates exactly oppositely, basically. Uh, and that's why we have this uh, bubble that shows the inversion. It's a uh, bubble is always emerging complement uh, in logic. And we discussed how this bulb uh, gets uh, lit when the transistor is turned on. In this case, it was an N-type transistor, but you could actually change this to P-type and it'll, uh, it, it'll operate with exactly the opposite voltages, All right? Okay, so hopefully this is clear. Uh, if not, you can go back and study the last lecture. And then we built logic gates out of this. And uh, we built first the inverter, which is over here on the left. And that's the simplest logic structure you can have in CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductors. Uh, and you can see that it basically inverts uh, the input variable A and Y e is equal to A bar. And you can see the logic gate symbol of the inverter. So it's the simplest function. It's a unary function, right? It takes a single input. And we also built the NAND gate first, as you can see on the right, basically, uh, NAND gate uh, takes uh, two inputs, A and B, and 
the output is one only if A and B are both one. Sorry, this is the end gate. <laughs> Sorry, NAND gate is on the, in the in the middle. I was going to do something else, but NAND gate is in the middle. NAND gate is basically uh, it also takes A and B as inputs to inputs, and the output is zero only if A and B are one, and output is one for all other input combinations. So it's exactly opposite of NAND. Basically, it's the inversion of uh, the AND gate over here. But we built NAND gate first because this was actually easier to build, and we discussed this. CMOS is inverting logic. Building inverted functions, NAND, NOR, are, uh, is easier because of the non-idealities in the transistors, as we discussed last time. I'm going to mention that again. So you cannot actually directly build an AND gate that operates correctly uh, without building the NAND gate first. This is uh, because uh, you, you have to have PMOS transistors connected to the top, which is power over here. And this is because PMOS transistors conduct uh, ones, which is high voltages, uh, much better uh, than NMOS transistors. And they are very bad at conducting actually zeros uh, because they work based on whole mobility. This is very, now below our abstraction level, actually. If you really need to understand this, you need to take a microelectronics fabrication, uh, microelectronics course or fabrication course, actually. Uh, so you cannot put the PMOS transistors down, which is really needed to build an AND gate uh, with, uh, with only four transistors, if you will. So if you cannot put the PMOS transistors down such that they conduct zeros uh, over here, you have to build an AND gate first, PMOS on top, NMOS at the bottom. And then you have to invert the output with an inverter, which we know how to build. And this is the smallest number of uh, transistors you can use to build uh, an AND gate in CMOS logic. Again, because of the non-idealities in the transistor. You can try to be smart, and uh, being smart uh, leads to a four gate, uh, four, four, uh, four uh, transistor AND gate, but then it doesn't work. Why? Because the abstraction level below says that these transistors don't work very well when they're uh, subject to different conditions than what we have shown over here. Okay, so I harped on this a little bit, but basically I think my point here is that uh, we're going to assume that these gates work, but there are things that make those gates work underneath. Don't ever think that it's magic. Underneath are these transistors, and transistors get combined in different ways, and we've discussed how to combine them reliably to make them work in CMOS technology. Now, if you try to be smart, if you want to do optimize underneath, you have to really understand what's going on. You cannot go to a circuit designer and say, Look, circuit designer, you're stupid. You're using all six, six of these transistors to build an AND gate. But I have an idea. You can actually use only four of these transistors. Just replace these, uh, uh, just basically put, put PMOS transistors underneath. And the circuit designer will laugh at you because they know something you don't know. That's the beauty of the abstraction layers, basically. If you really want to cross the abstraction layer, you better understand what the heck is going on underneath. Make, that makes sense, right? Okay. <laughs> so our abstraction layer is that these things work, but there is a lot that goes into making it work also. Okay. So that's our general CMOS gate structure, basically. Uh, this is the general form uh, used to construct any inverting logic gate. As I said, inverting logic gate, not NAND and NOR. You have a PMOS pull-up network that's connected to the power at the top. And then you have an NMOS pull-down network that's connected to the ground. And this is the ground signal. And they're both connected to the output in the middle. And then inputs get supplied to both of them. Uh, and the networks may consist of transistors in series or in parallel. That, depend, that determines the function in the end. When the transistors are in parallel, the network is on if any one of these transistors is on. Uh, if you go back over here, for example, we had these parallel transistors, P1 and P2, PMOS transistors. Uh, the, uh, they're in parallel. They're both connected from the power to the output. And uh, only one of these need to be turned on so that power gets connected to the output, right? Both of them can be on also, of course, right? based on circuit principles. And we have these MMOS transistors in series. If we want zero volts to get connected to the output, then both of these need to be turned on. Makes sense, hopefully, right? And that requires both inputs to be one in this particular case. Okay. So I already said this, but when transistors are in series, the network is on. Only if all transistors are, uh, that are in series are on. So never forget, PMOS transistors are used for pull-up because they're better that way. And NMOS transistors are used for pull-down. 
Now you can actually have a PMOS pull-up network that consists of transistors in series, oh, and then NMOS pull-down network that consists of transistors in parallel, and that would give you a NOR function. And you can actually think about that that way. You can make a three input, four input, five input, six input NOR by increasing the number of inputs and by increasing the transistor in parallel on top and series at the bottom. And your, uh, your book discusses these, and I will also show you another picture of three input NOR function later on. Okay. Uh, so uh, for this to work, exactly one of the networks should be on and the other network should be off at any given time. So it should be the fact that either this is on and this is off or this is off and this is on. Okay. If both networks are on, you're in trouble because both power and zero volts will be connected to the output. And that's essentially called a short circuit. And you will very, very likely get incorrect operation. If you don't get incorrect operation, you're very lucky. If both networks are off at the same time, because somehow you designed the circuit that way, somehow you had, a, you had some non-ideality, uh, then what happens is output doesn't get connected to either five volts at the top, or I said five volts, either uh, the power at the top or ground at the bottom. We call this as output is floating. Now, this is not necessarily incorrect operation, basically. It depends on what you intended with your circuit. In the logic uh, gates we, intended, uh, we intend to build over here, it is not desired operation, but output doesn't get connected to input means that means just that basically. Maybe in some cases you, want, you don't want output to get connected to input because you define the function that way. The function may be undefined for a particular input combination. And in that case, output is called floating. It's called, it's represented with a Z value as we will see later today also. And you will also use that in Verilog. So this is not necessarily incorrect. Keep this in mind. There are cases where output is undefined for a function. And in that case, floating is okay. But short circuit, almost always incorrect. You don't have any case where input combinations should lead to a short circuit. That's not in definition of a function in general. Of course, you can define anything, right? But then people don't do that in general because there's no benefit to a short circuit. It's very completely unpredictable. Whereas floating is predictable, right? It just says that output is not defined. It's not a function of input at that point. Okay, so why do we have this structure? I've already talked about this and harped on it. Basically, these transistors are imperfect switches. PMOS transistors pass ones well and zeros poorly because what carries charge is holes in PMOS. And these actually carry charge relatively slowly compared to electrons. So PMOS transistors turn out to be a little bit slower than NMOS transistors as well. So if you want to dig deeper, you'll learn more. NMOS transistors, on the other hand, pass zeros well, but ones poorly. Uh, because electrons carry charge and electrons tend to be very fast. And these are actually fabricated in different ways. If you look at the fabrication of the transistor, uh, the well and the gates and the drain are co uh, constructed differently. And I'm not going to talk about that clearly, uh, but uh, that's how it is. And in fact, historically, people knew how to build NMOS transistors very well because people actually were able to enable electrons to carry charge. PMOS transistors are a relatively new thing in the history of fabrication. And once they were added, the complementary metal oxide semiconductor technology took off because you could actually build the structure that I showed you earlier so that you could operate circuits much more reliably. Okay, this I already said. P is up, N is down. This is why AND is built with NAND and NOT, right? We already said that also. And that's the circuit structure in, P, uh, in, in CMOS. Okay, uh, so there are a bunch of other things we can dig deep deeper on. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. Latency, which one's faster, transistors in series or transistors in parallel? Any thoughts? Who says parallel? Okay, many people. Who says series is faster? Okay, you're in the minority, and in this case, you're wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> minority is not always wrong. In many cases, they may be right, but in this case, there's a fact, and the fact says transistors in series uh, are slower. Why? Because you basically, in order to connect the output to, uh, to, uh, the, uh, to either ground or zero, you have to go through more transistors. And the fact that there are more transistors you need to enable means that there's more resistance on the wire and resistance on the wire is directly correlated with latency. So if you go back to this picture over here, uh, these two transistors are in series. In order for the output to become zero volts, both of these transistors need to be enabled and uh, basically there's more resistance in the wire. Whereas if you look at the top structure over here, these two transistors are in parallel. In order for output to be, uh, to get three volts, either of these can be enabled. So you go through only one transistor to connect the 
uh, three volts to the output. So this is much faster in this case. Okay, so how do you alleviate this latency? Basically, you basically play some circuit tricks. I'm not going to go into this uh, in detail because this actually violates the CMOS, uh, if you will, but for example, this is a four input NOR gate uh, that gets rid of the PMOS uh, uh, transistors. It's, it's used, uh, in the past actually, people used to build things like this. Uh, currently, you may actually still want to build things like this if you want to get rid of transistors in series. Uh, now you can see that the NOR gate uh, consists of four transistors in parallel and they're very weak PMOS transistors over here. How it works, you need to really know the underlying fabrication, underlying microelectronics. But people play these tricks to speed up the circuits, transistor level tricks to speed up the circuits or make them more efficient. Okay, and these, these, these structures, as I said, were especially used uh, when PMOS transistors could not be fabricated reliably in the past. Today, they're also used. There are different tricks that are used, but very, very, uh, they, they may be used in very, very latency critical paths of a processor, for example. You have to make this frequency meet. Uh, we talk about timing in lecture, I don't know, six or seven. You have to make the, uh, you need to meet the frequency, but the latency of this gate is too long. Well, you, now you start playing transistor level tricks. Okay, power consumption. This is a critical, as I said today. Uh, and we have to touch on power consumption, energy consumption when we discuss things. Again, we're not going to go into a lot of detail, but you need to know that uh, these things consume power. Basically, whenever a transistor uh, turns on and off, it consumes power. This is called dynamic power consumption. Power is used to charge the capacitance as the signals change on the transistor, zero to one or one to zero. Whenever a transistor is off, it still consumes power. Even if it's not, the signals are not changing, it consumes power because there's leakage that happens in the circuit because the circuit is connected to power and also a ground. And there's some amount of current that's leaking in circuit. It could be a little amount, but it's leaking. So that's called static power consumption. So dynamic power consumption is usually expressed like this. It's a function of capacitance of the circuit. For example, how big the transistor is, how much charge capacitance it has, uh, the voltage that you apply to the transistor squared, and times the frequency of change. At what frequency are you actually switching the transistor, which is correlated with the frequency of the processor, for example. Okay, uh, so I already said this, I think. Uh, uh, but you can also see that uh, voltage plays a huge role. That's why people are trying to reduce the voltage of circuits so that they can reduce the dynamic power consumption. Uh, because voltage, as you can see, uh, there's a quadratic relationship between power and voltage. And in fact, if you want to increase the frequency, which is important for latency, frequency of switching that is how fast, how many transitions per second you can enable the transistor to make. That's essentially gigahertz, for example, today. Uh, in some other uh, electrical systems, it's terahertz, right? Terahertz level. Now, if you want to increase that, it turns out you cannot operate at very low voltage because at very low voltage, transistors become very unreliable. So if you really want to increase frequency, you also want to increase voltage. So voltage essentially it has a cubic relationship. If you think about frequencies, it's also linearly correlated with voltage. Voltage has a cubic relationship with uh, power. So ideally, you would like to reduce voltage as much as possible. Okay. But there, as you reduce voltage, uh, things become less reliable because the transistors need to turn on. And uh, uh, it, it, at, at some point, the transistors stop turning on if you don't apply enough voltage to the gate, for example. Okay, static power consumption, as I said, this is happening even if you're not doing anything on your computer, as long as it's powered on, uh, the current is leaking. So there's a leakage current, and then there's a voltage also. Uh, this is another voltage actually in the transistor, and you multiply them. Uh, this is for a single transistor. And then if you have uh, trillions of transistors, you multiply by trillions, basically. Now you can see that every transistor in the system is leaking. Of course, different transistors may be leaking at different uh, uh, voltage and uh, leakage current levels. Okay, but this is a very simple equation per transistor, let's say, or per circuit. Okay, so in the, uh, yeah, hopefully this is clear. Energy consumption in the end is power times time. Basically, you... Uh, you, uh, energy is really, uh, uh, power is instantaneous, right? And you basically sum up uh, each power. It, it, energy is really the integral of the power uh, curve over time. So you, be, you keep consuming energy over time. So uh, basically both of these contribute to energy in the end. And that's why you want to minimize both of these. Does that make sense? Okay. 
OK, so let's go back to the logic gates. So these are our logic gates. Uh, I've already added a couple of more over here. Uh, so we, we built the AND, NAND, inverter. Now you should know how to build OR, NOR. I actually said that. And then there is XOR and XNOR. You should be able to build these functions using uh, transistors, but we're not going to really ask you for that. This should be for your uh, fun. XOR is a function where uh, if an even uh, number of the inputs uh, is 1, then the output is 1. If an odd number of the inputs is uh, uh, 1, then the output is, uh, wait, wait. Basically, if an even number of the inputs is 1, the output is 1. Otherwise, it's 0, right? That's XOR in the end. And this is a two-input XOR. So it's a useful function to think about. We're going to see that a lot. It's used for building adders, for example. It's the sum function of an adder. OK. So you can build larger gates also, as I alluded to. So this is a three-input NAND gate, as you can see. Uh, you basically add another parallel transistor over here, HEMOS. And then you add uh, another series transistor, NMOS, over here. So this is three inputs now. You can actually do a three-input function. With this in mind, you can actually do any uh, M input function, right? Of course, now, now your gates become becomes huge. And it becomes slower also because uh, more uh, there will be more transistors in series, at least for NAND over here and for NOR at the top. OK, and your, pay, uh, your, your book has other examples, which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> OK, so everybody's happy now. You can build uh, logic gates, at least the basic ones. Sounds good. Any questions? OK, so now I'm going to take a quick aside, and then we're going to continue uh, the building block. So how many people know about Moore's law here? How many people do not know about Moore's law? OK, that's good. It's fine if you don't know about it. But this is uh, the fact that transistors are increasing over decades. So this is from 2005, as you can see. I already mentioned that 4004 had about 2,000 transistors, something like that. And basically, Gordon Moore, in his seminal paper that you're going to review for extra credit, showed that uh, this transistor count is doubling every uh, one and a half years or so. And the reason is basically people are able to uh, scale the circuits. It's called technology scaling, such that you can put more transistors in a given area. And these are the curves from his original paper, basically. This is the number of components per integrated circuit, and this is the relative manufacturing cost per component. If you, can, if you look at this, the curve in 1962 looks like this. So there's, an, there's a Pareto optimal point. There's an optimal point. Uh, in terms of the number of components per circuit that minimizes the cost per component. Th that's what Moore's law is about, actually. It's really uh, a law of economics, if you will. And in 1965, that optimal point shifted to the right. And in 1970, that optimal point shifted even more to the right. And we keep shifting to the right because people are advancing the technology. And this is uh, quite amazing, certainly. You can see that this is 2011, and that's Gordon Moore. Uh, and the curve fits. And this is 2016, and this is the most recent I have, uh, 2020. You can see that the curve kind of still fits, actually. We're having difficulties, though. It's becoming more difficult uh, to add more transistors. But this is our, your recommended reading. It's only two pa three pages. It's an empirical observation, actually. It basically says that I observe this, and I expect that this will continue to happen because, of the, because we are able to manufacture, come up with better manufacturing technology. But of course, uh, this is his prediction, as you can see. This is the expectation. Uh, you can read that. But there is another expectation. That's, uh, will it be possible to remove the heat generated by tens of thousands of components in a single silicon chip? We're at that point, actually, today. That was predicted in 1965. In 2010s or so, power became a big issue because you have billions of transistors on a chip. And how do you actually take the heat uh, that is generated because of so much power that's, uh, that's consumed by those transistors? So we're actually having a lot of problems with thermals today. We'll, we will talk about that maybe later on. But uh, don't, again, take this for granted, because there is actually a lot of innovation that goes into making this happen, especially today. Today is much more difficult to reduce the size of a transistor. I'll show you a picture soon. But manufacturing small transistors and structures, uh, some structures are already a few atoms in size. So how does this get manufactured? Uh, if you, I would be curious about this, and I would read about this, but uh, I, this course is not about that, clearly. If you want to manufacture... Uh, things that are this small, you need to find the right materials. So there's actually a lot of material science and engineering that goes into this. What kind of materials do you use? Copper, aluminum, something else, graphene, hafnium oxide. This is material science, basically. And these different materials are combined in how you manufacture a processor today. Transistor is part of it, but there's also things that communicate between transistors, right? 
And you need to make sure all materials are compatible when you manufacture things. And then precision manufacturing, which is one of the biggest difficulties uh, today. How, to kind of, uh, how, how do you pattern these things? You have a silicon wafer. It's essentially silicon. First of all, how do you get to a silicon wafer is another question, of course. But once you have the silicon wafer, how do you actually pattern these transistors on top of this so that they actually uh, do what you want them to do? Okay, that's, e that's relatively easy if the transistors are large. What if the transistors are a few atoms in size, right? Now this becomes difficult and people have actually developed a lot of technologies. Extreme ultraviolet technology is one of the examples of this. Uh, again, this is not the subject of this course, but hopefully the goal, a big goal of this course is to enable you to think critically and broadly. Never think that there's magic underneath. There's a whole lot of hard work that has gone to make this happen basically. And we will see that very briefly. And then creating new device technologies is important because the transistor that I showed you, abstraction level, it looks like this, right? Oh, it looks great. It has a gate source drain. Yeah, but it's not really like that. It's actually, there's a lot of innovation that goes into the transistor. There are different types of transistors, single electron, gate all around. How do you, where do you put the gate compared to the source and drain? Is it two dimensional or three dimensional? Today's transistors are actually three dimensional things. Uh, twin FETs are used, again, I'm throwing you words here, but uh, this is a transistor, for example, that's used by Intel. That's their visualization of it. You can watch their video that they introduced. Uh, this is the Intel seven nanometer technology. Seven nanometer refers to uh, roughly uh, the length of the gate of a transistor. But I say roughly because that's not exactly like that. It's more of a marketing term today, but you can use that as an idea of how, how, how uh, wide your transistor is today. Seven nanometers, very small, right? We're going to go down to two or three nanometers soon. And this is an example. I like this one because that transistor that I showed you in 2022, it's right here somewhere. You know, that dot over here. Do you see that? I don't. And I think this was the transistor that was used in, I don't know, some number of years ago, 1970 or so. I don't know. Don't quote me on it. You can look at Intel. But basically, you can see the difference, right? This is a huge monumental structure, and this is a little dot over here. So that's another view of Moore's law. And what has enabled these things is some of the most complicated machines that are built today. How many people heard about this technology, EUV, extreme ultraviolet technology? Okay, that's good, more than I expected. Basically, this is the technology that enabled us to actually, let's say, push Moore's law to uh, a little bit further, if you will, because people are actually quite pessimistic in manufacturing, some people, uh, smaller transistors at some point, because it's very difficult to do that with uh, if, you, if your light source is actually not precise enough, you cannot manufacture a small enough transistor. And these folks at ASML, uh, which is a Dutch company, uh, developed this sophisticated machine that can actually pattern these transistors to much smaller technology nodes. But it was extremely costly, and there's a lot of research that went into it for decades. And you can read more about it, if you will. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but there's a lot of information uh, on it if you're interested. Again, this is below our level of abstraction. But there's a lot that goes into making these transistors happen in the first place and then work in the next place. And we're going to assume all of that. So basically, uh, we've kind of took a, a de uh, taken a detour on devices and how to make them work over here. So how do you put electrons to work for you, basically? So there's that layer that's really critical. And if that layer ends, if this machine is not good enough, maybe we won't be able to manufacture smaller transistors. Then the question becomes, how do we actually keep putting more uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a single chip. Maybe we don't want to put more, we'll see. But maybe we move to another technology at that point. You will probably live through that. <laughs> okay, so that's why there's, there's plenty of room at the bottom, basically. This is another example of the plenty of room at the bottom enabled by this machine that I showed you over here. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm going to assign you Moore's Law paper. This is from 1965. It's written in a different style. But it's only three pages, maybe two and a half pages, actually. Very simple to read. So this is another freebie for you, if you will, for to get 1%. <laughs> and I think it's, uh, it's nice if people read these historical papers uh, that have actually set the stage. Okay, there's some guidelines on how to review papers critically. You can also uh, refer to them uh, on the web page. Are these already online? These guidelines, Mohammed? Okay, so it's already online. If not, they will be online. Okay, with that detour, now let's move back uh, to come. Uh, any, any questions on this, by the way? I didn't go into depth because there's nothing to go into depth here. If you want to go into depth again, take a microelectronics uh, circuits course that will not talk about, that's, that course will not talk about those machines. 
if you really want to see how a machine gets built, you need to take a fabrication course. I need to, this is really at a lower level. You actually take, if, if the course uh, enables you, you actually take the wafers and build these chips yourself. Okay. So, but we're going uh, to draw an abstraction level, as I said. And now uh, let's continue our abstraction level. We can now build logic circuits. Now we understand basic logic gates. What do we do next, right? We can build some uh, of the uh, logic structures that are important components of the microarchitecture of a computer. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of today. So what is a logic circuit then? Uh, a gate we already defined, right? A gate does some function. Logic circuit is a combination of those gates, basically. Uh, but uh, at a higher level of abstraction, it has some inputs, clearly. It has some outputs, because it, it, you need to, it's, it's essentially performing a function. And it has a functional specification. Uh, that functional specification is, uh, what is the relationship between inputs and outputs? We're going to go into it a little bit more. Usually, it has a timing specification as well. Basically, how long does it take to get the output once the inputs start changing? That's called timing. That's the latency of the circuit. We're going to discuss that in lecture again, six or seven or so. Uh, uh, but keep this in mind. Yes, we already discussed this, basically. That's the definition of timing. In today's lecture, tomorrow's lecture, we're not going to talk uh, much about timing. We're going to look at the logical functionality, functional specification, in other words. So what are the different types of logic circuits? I mentioned this last time uh, before, but we're going to talk about combination logic. Combination logic doesn't have any memory, basically. Outputs are strictly dependent on the combination of input values that are being applied to the circuit right now. There is no memory. There is no storage inside here. Now, clearly, that's not enough. That's why we're going to, uh, in some books, these are called combinatorial logic. I don't like that terminology. Combinational is much better. Uh, but uh, clearly, it's not enough uh, to uh, build a system because you need some memory, actually, to remember what, what went on. Uh, so we'll learn about sequential logic, which has memory. Uh, structures now can store history over there, can store data values. And the outputs are a function of the historical values that are stored as well as the inputs that are currently being applied. So we will see this tomorrow and then next week, of course. And you need both combination logic and sequential logic to make systems work. You need combination logic to make sequential logic work, and you need combination and sequential logic to make a processor work. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Now we'll get to something you know, probably Boolean logic equations. Uh, because we built logic gates, these are actually things that we can express using logic equations. Uh, so functional specification is all about Boolean logic equations, actually. Uh, it's uh, the, uh, basically, what do, you mean by, what do you mean by function, basically? Function is really a unique mapping of input values to output values. Uh, the same input values are expected to produce the same output value every time. So there is no randomness. Of course, you may actually specify a function to include randomness in it as well. You need to explicitly specify it, right? So there could be a random number generation circuit, for example then that needs to be explicitly specified and incorporated into the inputs. These are actually fascinating things. These things, random numbers, are employed for many things today, including cryptography. And you need to actually build these circuits that do random number generation, so they, they need to be explicit. Uh, okay, there's no memory, as we said, because we're talking about combination logics right now. Output does not depend on past input values. Let's take a look at a simple thing. This is called a one-bit adder. Basically, uh, you, you're adding two bits, A and B, and then you get a sum, and then you get a carry out, and then there's a carry in, assuming this is not the first bit, assuming you're cascading uh, the addition with multiple bits. Right? So it's a, actually a three input function, and it has two outputs. Each input is one bit, and the sum is a function of A, B, C, in, and carry is a function of A, B, C, in as well. And it turns out, if you actually do the binary addition, these are the functions you would get. Sum is essentially a three input XOR. Sum is uh, one if an odd number of these is one and is zero if otherwise, basically even number of these is uh, one. Carry out is essentially AB plus ACN plus BCN. Plus is, uh, okay, let me actually talk about the terminology. Uh, plus is OR, that's what we will use, and dot which is omitted over here, is AND. So this is really A and B, or A and C, or B, C. And this turns out to be a three-input majority. Majority means if at least two of the three inputs is one, 
the output is one, otherwise the output is zero. Okay, and now you can see also this plus with a circle that's XOR basically. So you will need to get used to the notation also. I know different classes, etc., use different notations, but this is a very this is the notation that's used in logic design and computer architecture. Plus is or, dot is end, and plus circled is XOR. Okay, so we will uh, we'll, you can you will be able to build the truth table for this. Actually, you can we're going to see the truth table later today. But probably you should be able to build the truth table right now, assuming you know what binary addition is. And we will see that. My internet connection is unstable. Is that correct? <laughs> this gives you a small break. I guess it looks okay to me. So let's take a look at some simple equations, not and and or. We've seen these already, right? Uh, basically, you can express these simple equations as circuits also, right? Uh, this is a bar, which reads not a, and is one if and only if a is zero. A dot b reads also a and b, and we already know the function, so I'm not going to repeat it. And a or b reads a or b. Unfortunately, plus is overloaded, uh, but in logic, it reads as a or b. Sometimes this dot is omitted, as I said, right? If you see a, b together, that's a and b. And... All of these functions have truth tables, as we discussed last time. Basically, a truth table is a representation of the function where you have inputs on, uh, columns and then output columns. And then input columns show all of the combination of the inputs, and it shows you what is the output value for a given combination. And we're going to use all of these, a lot of these truth tables to express circuits. Okay, and these are very simple circuits, as you can see. And this, these are Boolean equations, actually. So Boolean algebra was developed by this person who is pictorialized here. It's an algebra on ones and zeros. That's the uh, alphabet, if you will, uh, with and or not operations. And you start with the axiom, some basic things that you assume to be true. And I'm going to show you a bunch of these. And then you draw, uh, der derive laws and theorems. This allow you to these allow you to manipulate Boolean expressions. And you can also ask, why is this useful? Well, it's useful because they allow you to simplify the Boolean expressions. So you may have a very complicated Boolean expression. You look at that expression and you start simplifying it. For example, A plus A is A. All right, you're going to see some examples. A plus A, B is also A. And you'll see that. And you can imagine why that is. You can actually prove that. But clearly, if you know this, it doesn't make sense to build a bigger circuit in general. And that's why we want to simplify things. If you have a complicated equation, simplify it so that the circuit is smaller, right? Because uh, these things are going to be, these uh, and, or, and not is going to be realized using gates in the end. And you can also manipulate the expression so that express them in different ways. For example, uh, you may have a really great NAND circuit that your circuit designer built. It's faster than anything else. It's low power than anything else. And circuit designer tells you that don't use NORs. Don't use nots. Don't use ands. Please give me the equation with just nands so that I can build everything with nands. Boolean algebra allows you to do that. Basically, you can, you can uh, uh, convert everything to nands. It may not be the simplest form, but it satisfies what your circuit designer wants you to do, basically. And they may have a good reason for wanting you to do that, right? So basically, that's the power of Boolean algebra. It enables you to express things using... Uh, gates that may be better than others, underlying gates, right? So, okay, uh, basically we will drive more sophisticated properties also. That's why Boolean algebra is useful, basically. It maps to logic gates directly. And again, if you really want to do the mapping nicely, you need to know the underlying properties of the logic gate so that you use the Boolean algebra to transform one function to another function, equal fun uh, they both perform the same thing, such that you maximize the use of the gates that are desirable and you minimize the use of the gates that are not desirable for some reason. Again, the reason may be power, latency, reliability, right? There could be many reasons. The metrics that we talked about in the last lecture, there could be many, many metrics over there. Okay, so axioms. Uh, well, we've already discussed this. Uh, closure is the result of and and or stays in the set you start with. These are kind of obvious. Uh, commutative laws, basically A plus B is equal to B plus A. This is also true in math. Uh, a times B is equal to B times A. That's also true in math. 
uh, identity, uh, basically there are identity elements for and and or that give you back the element you started with. Basically A or with zero is A, A ended with one is A. Uh, you can somehow, uh, you can use the equations both ways. Sometimes you uh, expand A as A ended with one. Sometimes you reduce A plus A and one to A basically. Depending on what you want to do with these equations, you can expand or uh, reduce. Distributed laws, uh, again, if you look over here, uh, B and C is here. A or with B and C can be distributed this way, A or B and uh, A or C. And then the other way around is also true. Uh, Complements, basically, A or A bar is true. That's basically the truth. Either A is true or A bar is true. There is no, let's say, flakiness, right? <laughs> and Either um, A and A bar is false. Both cannot be true, basically. All right. Again, this is logic. Okay, let's be more complicated. Duality is all of the axioms come in dual form, actually. This is useful for transformations, as I said. Uh, anything true for an expression is also true for its dual. So any derivation you make uh, that is true can be flipped into a dual form. So let's take a look at this dual form. More formally, a dual of a Boolean expression is derived by replacing every and with or, every or with and, every constant one with a constant zero and every constant zero with a constant one. And don't do anything else, basically. So you can replace one equation with another. So this is an example. A and B plus C uh, looks this way, right? This is actually an equation. You can basically replace every or with end and every end with or, and that holds true also. And you can verify that holds true. This duality is a very useful property. This way you can go from one type of gates to another type of gates, but it's not enough by itself, as you can see. Okay, what else? Uh, this is the dual, basically. Uh, X or zero is X, X and one is X. Basically, this is, these are two duals. These are duals because we replace or with and and zero with one, right? And the other way is also true. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Idempotency is X or X is X, X and X is X. These are also duals. Uh, this is the dual of this is itself, basically, x complement complement is x, uh, and x or x bar is 1. Again, the dual of that is x and x bar is 0. And commutativity dual is x plus y, x or y is, uh, is equal to y or x, and x and y is equal to y and x. Okay. So let's take a look at a little bit more complicated of these things. Associativity, uh, you can see uh, this over here, x plus y plus c, it associates. You can basically combine these in, with different parentheses, if you will. And then dual is also true for and. Distribution, we also uh, discussed this briefly, but you can distribute uh, and over or, and uh, or over and. Again, these are duals. So let's take a look at simplification theorems. These are actually uh, commonly used. So x and y plus x and y bar is equal to x. And then there's a dual also, which I'm not going to go into. Otherwise, we'll be here, me reciting equations to you all the time. It's kind of boring. This is very important, actually. x and x and y, uh, sorry, x or x and y is x, and the dual is also true. This happens a lot in circuits. And then there's the last one, which I'll let you read. So you can actually prove things, as I said. Uh, I just assumed earlier that this is true, but the way you prove things is by using the uh, axioms and theorems. So you distribute x over y and y bar, and y uh, or y bar over here is one, based on the complement rule. And then x and one is equal to x based on the identity rule. So basically, you can prove things. Even if you didn't know the right side, you could uh, get to the right side uh, uh, of the equation by using distributive complement identity rules. As I said, this uh, shows up a lot in equations. Again, you can prove this right by expanding x to be x and one, and you have x and y, and then distributing x over one and y, you get this one or y is one, and then x and one is x. So this x plus x and, y, x and y magically becomes x, but it's not magic as you can see. So whenever you see this, a lot of designers basically say this is x and they get rid of it. <laughs> okay, De Morgan's law, how many people know about De Morgan's laws? Okay, so I, I need to go faster, I guess. <laughs> Am I going fast, too fast or too slow? It's okay? Okay, I see nodding. Okay, De Morgan's law uh, uh, is another example of transformation. So uh, my favorite example of this is uh, this, basically. So basically, it's, it's shown over here. Uh, let's take a look at one example. F is equal to, if it's true, if A or B or C is true, the way I think of De Morgan's law is logically. Logically, this equation says at least one of A, B, C is true. And if you take the De Morgan of it, which is basically this, uh, complement of the complement, and then 
uh, you basically, uh, yeah. Yeah, you basically, you basically take the dual. Uh, but it's not the, basically, this says that it's not the case that A, B, C are all false. So logically, the, these statements are equivalent, right? A, B, C is true. I, 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 at least one of A, B, C is true, is equal to, it's not the case that A, B, C are all false, which is what the state's over here. Okay, so this enables actually conversion between different types of logic functions. If you do not have every type of gate as we discussed, or if some types of gates are more desirable to use than others. So let's take a look at this example. In this case, we see nor. De Morgan says nor is equivalent to end with inputs complemented, right? So now you actually, if you don't have a good or gate or nor gate, you actually can build uh, an and gate or an and gate, right? That's what this looks like, right? So this is uh, nor. It actually looks like this. It's, these two are equivalent, basically. This is also called bubble pushing. It's in your paper. It's in your book if you read it. Basically, if you want to convert this gate to another gate, you take the bubble over here and you push it back to both inputs, and then you change the type of the gate from or to end. It, it's going to work over here also, as you will see. So this is also uh, the Morgan over here. This is NAND. NAND is equivalent to or with inputs complemented. So let's do bubble pushing on this one. Bubble pushing says, take the bubble, push it into the input. So now we have two bubbles over here, and then turn the end into an OR. And that equation also holds. And then you can verify with truth tables, which I'm not going to do, but these are relatively simple functions. So that's the beauty of De Morgan's law. Basically, it enables you to change the type of the gate. Now we're talking, right? Now the, you can actually build a computer program that applies these transformations to optimize the number of gates that are desirable, right? This is called logic synthesis. And this is done, or electronic design automation. You basically specify a circuit using Boolean equations, feed it to a computer program, and the computer program also knows the characteristics of the library, underlying hardware library, which is a bunch of gates that someone can build. And these have specifications in terms of latency, area, energy. And you also provide an optimization metric to this program and press a button. And the program gives you a Boolean equation as well as a circuit, as well as a, 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 a gate level mapping that maximizes the metrics uh, that you are actually looking for. That's why these equations are very useful. Okay, now let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> so basically, Boolean equations enable us to represent the function of a combination logic block. This is functional specification. And as a result, they also enable us to methodically transform the function to simpler functions, which lead to different hardware realizations. This is called logic minimization, logic simplification, and in general, logic synthesis also, if, you, if it's used broadly. We can automate this process, you, uh, and that automation is called computer-aided design or electronic design automation. So the key is really different Boolean expressions lead to different logic gate implementations. Me, this always implies different hardware area, cost, latency, and energy properties, and reliability. That's why we normally start with standardized representations. I'm going to take, uh, uh, cover the standardized representations, and we're going to take a break. So these standardized functions are actually important. Uh, we almost always qu ask questions on exams about these and how to minimize them. So these are actually good exam questions also, easy exam questions, I would say. Basically, uh, these enable a single, universally agreed on way of representing a Boolean function starting from its truth table. These are also called canonical representations. So there are two forms, sum of products form and product of sums form. Uh, and I'm going to mainly cover the sum of products form and product of sum form. There are slides, but I'm going to go through them relatively quickly because they're the same. So what's the key idea? Basically, assume that we have the truth table of a Boolean function f. How do you express this function in terms of the inputs in a standard manner? So one example is sum of product form. Express the truth table as a two-level Boolean expression. And we will see how that's done. This expression contains all input variable combinations that result in a one output, one or zero. There, these are the two possible outputs. Uh, these are the all input variable combinations that result in a one output. If any of the combinations of input variables that results in a one is true, then the output is one. Now, this should tell you that there is an or involved here, right? If any of these combinations is true, the output is one. That means that you or the different combinations. Now, now what are those combinations? Basically, F is the OR of all input variable combinations that result in a one. Now you need to express those combinations that result in a one, such that they actually result in a one. So let's do that. The best way of doing is with example. I'm going to later uh, put some terminology into this also. This is also called in some other ways. Some of products is better, I think. Uh, so basically, you look at 
all of the input combinations, they're also called min terms, we will define that later, for which the output of the function is true or one. So you can see that there are five input combinations. This is the truth table. You have three inputs, one output. There are two to the three entries, two to the three min terms, in other words, two to the three possible input combinations. And then you express the variables, input variables, such that they lead to one. So zero, one, one leads to one output. Or one, zero, zero, meaning A is one, B is zero, C is zero, leads to one output. Or one, zero, one leads to one output. Or one, one, zero leads to one output. Or one, one, one leads to one output. I've already given you the equation, actually. So basically, for this function to be true, uh, A bar B C should be true, or A B bar C bar should be true, or A B bar C should be true, or A B C bar should be true, or A B C should be true. That's just logical, right? And that's the sum of products form, basically. Function is or of all input variable combinations that result in a one. And all Boolean equations can be written in the sum of products form where you express uh, the output as the or of all input combinations that lead to a one. Makes sense, right? So now you have or, and then this is an end. So you have a, a, a three input end over here because you have three inputs. If you had 20 inputs, there would be a 20 input end. And then you have a bunch of uh, or gates and the number of or gates is uh, essentially the number of uh, well, number of ors that you have is essentially the number of one outputs minus one, because you're adding five things in this case, and you need four of the pluses, right? Okay, hopefully it makes sense, right? So this is clear. Now I'll uh, put you some give you some terminology, but you already know how to actually express a function using sum of products form. So complement, you know the terminology. It's a variable with a bar over it. Literal is variable or its complement, a or a bar. Implicant is product and or uh, of literals, basically it's just and. Now min term is product that includes all input variables. Min term is essentially a line in the truth table that includes all of the input variables, A, B, C bar for a three input basically. So for a three input function, you always need to have three, uh, uh, three uh, literals uh, uh, inside the min term. And the max term, which will be useful for product of sums form is a sum that includes all input variables. Now, let's take a look at uh, truth table again. Truth table is the unique signature of a Boolean function, but it's expensive. A Boolean function can have many alternative Boolean expressions. Basically, in other words, many alternative Boolean expressions may have the same truth table. So they, uh, they all lead to different uh, implementations as we discussed, I'm uh, repeating this. That's why we even need a canonical form to start with, standard form for a Boolean expression. This provides a unique algebraic signature for a function. So I've already shown you this. Now, let me repeat it with the terminology. Each row in the truth table has a min term. So a min term is each of these, basically. A min term is a product of literals, as we defined earlier. Each min term is true for that row and only on that row for that row. Now, all Boolean equations can be written in SOP form. You just need to find the min terms that lead to a one and express them like this, basically. If this min term is true, then the function is true because of the or over here. Okay, so I think I, I've already uh, uh, kind of uh, gone through this, but this input, if you give one, zero, one, it activates this term, that becomes one. Uh, only the shaded product term will be one and everything else will be zero. This is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. But the function is one. Uh, this is what you get basically. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And if you or them, you get a one. If inputs A, B, C do not correspond to any product term in the expression, then you get zero for output. Those are these input combinations over here, and they do not exist over here. They should not exist in the sum of products form. Now, if you know this, you can actually agree upon an order. Basically, you can agree upon the order of the variables in the rows of the truth table. Then you can enumerate each row with a decimal number. This is relatively easy. I'll show you pictorially again. So if you look over here, one zero zero is decimal four. Zero 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 is decimal zero. So you can think of this as min term four or small m4. And this is decimal seven, one, one, one. That, was, that input combination is decimal seven. So you can think of it as midterm seven. Now we're becoming a little bit more rigorous. We can express this function as sum of products of min term three uh, plus min term four plus min term five plus min term six plus min term seven. Or you can use a summation notation. So this is a function now. If somebody gives you the sum of products form, you can generate the truth table at top. It basically says, 
min terms three, four, five, six, seven are part of the sum of products. Makes sense, right? So we just basically agreed on a notation over here. So this is a canonical form. This is a shorthand notation. And this is how you express this function. And you can actually easily get to this function. This is not the minimal form. Now, if someone gives you a function saying that, uh, min terms three, four, five, six, seven, a three input function, they have to specify how many inputs there are. Uh, this is a three input, and this is assumed to be a single output uh, because for every output, you need to do this. Uh, canonical form is not the minimal form. You have to go through Boolean minimization rules, which I'm not going to go through, but you can actually do it yourself. This is the minimal form. Minimal form is A plus BC, but you can get to it from, uh, from that sum of product form that someone specified. And again, if you want to automate this process, tell the computer, I have a three input function with min terms three, four, five, six, seven as part of the sum of products. Give me, give me a logic realization of this that is minimal. I don't care what circuit it is, you will get this one. Give me a logic realization of this that consists of only NAND gates, you'll get something else that's not here. If you give it, give it some consists of NOR gates, then you'll get something else. Now you could actually change the optimization problem to be more complicated. So this is the simple realization. Okay, if you actually do the sum of products form, this is just one function, a different function. It looks like this because you can see that this is a, these are the sum, uh, uh, these are the products. Three min terms are enabled over here. You have AND gates. You have two, three, three input AND gates here, and then one three input uh, OR gate. So it's two level logic, right? One level gets you uh, the products, one level gets you the sum. Sum is AND again, plus, remember, product is AND. Uh, sorry, sum is OR, product is AND. So as, as, uh, as you can see, this is not minimal logic. Okay. So I think uh, I will stop here. We'll take a 10 minute break. And then we're we'll very quickly talk about product of sums, which is going to be very similar to this, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. And then we're going to continue on to more fun things.
Okay, let's get started. Is everything good? Okay. Okay, well, we'll continue with where we left off, which was this slide. Uh, we were looking at sum of products form, and we basically said that you can express any function as in sum of products form. So now if I give you uh, the min terms of the function, you can actually build that equation. You can show the truth table and you can simplify the function based on some constraints. Okay, as we said, sum of, program form, sum of product form leads to two level logic, an array of AND gates. Those, are pro those give you the min terms that are participating in the product. Uh, and it's always uh, N input AND gates where n is the number of inputs to the function. And then uh, these get ORed using the second level OR gate. And again, this could be logic that you build the function with. This is literally following the sum of products uh, equation. But again, this is not minimal. As we discussed, it's, it may not be desirable. But we will see that this is used in programmable logic arrays. Programmable logic array uh, is a, it enables you to build this two-level logic uh, by programming uh, which inputs get connected to uh, which uh, uh, yeah which of, which of these uh, which of these which of the outputs of the AND gates get connected to which of the uh, inputs of OR gates over here. So there could be an array of OR gates as potential outputs and an array of AND gates that provide you all the min terms of a function and you decide which min terms get connected to which output. Uh, and then you can think of this as a programmable circuit basically. And we will see that later today. Okay, so I think uh, we've already discussed this, but uh, we, uh, in, in sum of products form, the one bit output of the function is represented as sum or of all min terms that lead to a one in the output. Logically, the function evaluates the true, in other words, output is one, if any of the products to, uh, or min terms causes the output to be one. And we've already discussed this basically. Uh, sum of products form represents the function as a sum or or of all products or min terms that cause the output to be one. Okay, so let's take a look at the alternative very quick. The alternative product, so, product of sums. Basically, instead of focusing on the ones in the output, now you fo we're gonna focus on the zeros. What makes a function zero? And you basically express uh, the function such that if any max term is zero, the function will be zero. So now this should imply that, yeah, have an end because if any of the inputs is zero or any of the input combinations is zero, the function will be zero. So the second level will be end and the first level will be or actually. So it's really the De Morgan of the sum of products of F bar, complement of the function. This is another way of remembering it, but I'd rather remember it <laughs> the other way, let's say. So basically you need to find all input combinations or max terms in this particular case for which the output of the function is false. And function is essentially end of the old input variable combinations that result in a zero. So let's take a look at the same function. This is actually the same function. 
you we're focusing we're going to focus on the zeros what makes these zeros uh, uh, basically uh, the max terms we're going to write the function as a function of the max terms and max term is abc and then abc bar and then a b bar c as you can see if any of these is terms is zero you get a zero in the output and abc is zero if all abc is zero so that max term is activated as you can see that's the product of sums basically each sum term represents one of the zeros zero outputs of the function and the function evaluates to false in other words output is zero if any of the sums or max terms cause the output to be zero so let's take a look at this basically uh, if we apply uh, basically this becomes zero if zero if all of the inputs uh, is zero as you can see this becomes zero if a b is zero and c is one okay so if this input is applied you activate this term and for the given input only the shaded sum term will equal zero because these are uh, disjoint from each other the max terms and you get uh, zero at the end and anything because anything ended with zero is zero so hopefully this is clear it's exactly opposite in one sense. The real technical term is the Morgan of sum of products of F prime. You can compute it that way also, basically. You basically take the demo, you basically compute the sum of products of F prime. And if prime is essentially what? Basically, you, you, you put F prime here, it should be one, 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 zero, 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 zero. Those are the different outputs. And then you compute the sum of products of that and then to more, uh, take the Morgan of that. It'll give you the exact same equation over here. Okay, so I think I've already done this, so I'm not going to do that again, but basically that input uh, leads to F equals zero by activating this term over here, which we just did earlier. Okay, so how do you write it? Again, you can standardize this, basically. You find the tr uh, truth table rows where uh, function is zero, uh, and you basically write these uh, like this. Zero in input column is a true literal, one in input column is a complemented literal. That's how you decide this. Basically, if A, B, C, whenever it, all, all of those are zeros, you get a zero. So you need to make sure uh, this term evaluates to zero. When Z, uh, A is zero, B is zero, C is zero, that's what requires uh, this, the, all of these to be, uh, let's say, not complemented, if you will. And you get the or, you or the literals to get the max term, and then you end the max terms. So this is the max term. Uh, you or these literals, and then you end the max term. So there's a methodology for doing this also, but I think logically thinking is easy as well. Or you just remember what I just said earlier, which I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> okay, so the canonical notation also is very simple over here. Instead of using min terms, now we use max term, big M, basically. You can specify this function as the product of these three max terms, one, zero, one, two. This is the same function, as I said earlier. The same function can be written as product of m012 or sum of little m three through seven, right? Which we did earlier. Okay, basically you need to find the zeros. This is not the complement of the function. Sometimes people make the mistake. No, is this a complement? No, it's the same function that we showed in sum of product from earlier. We're just looking at the zero outputs as opposed to one outputs. If you wanna look at the complement, you need to complement F bar over there. So the function will look different. So there are a bunch of useful conversions, which I will leave on the slide mostly, but basically uh, min term to max term conversion, the function that we wrote earlier with min terms, sum of products is the same as the function that we wrote later, max terms. Basically you use exactly opposite uh, numbers for min terms versus max terms, if you will. Max term to min term also holds basically, obviously. Uh, you can, if you want to take the complement of a function, this is the function specified in terms of sum of products, min terms. Complement is essentially the other min terms, the remaining min terms. Basically, if the function is true, if min terms three, four, five, six, seven is true, the complement function is true if the remaining min terms are true. That's true for the max term as well. The other max terms should be zero, basically. Uh, the, the max terms that are not included in the function should be z should be included in the complement. Hopefully that's also obvious, right? And then you can do more sophisticated things that I'm not going to talk about over here, but these are also conversions that are logical. Okay, any questions? Okay, now you know actually where to start, how to simplify things. And uh, as I said, these are uh, important things for you to know and relatively easy things, if you will. 
So in the, in the exam, for example, we may ask you questions. Uh, this is the uh, mean term representation of a function. Uh, express this function as uh, a Boolean equation that includes only NAND gates, right? Only NANDs. That's relatively easy. And you will do some exercises in your homework. And you can find past exams also that talk about that. OK, so now let's talk about logic simplification a little bit. Using Boolean algebra, we can simplify any sum of products or product of some forms in a methodical way. You start with this canonical form. It enables convenience and automation. Basically, a truth table uh, it can be easily converted into sum of products, products, some forms. And then you can actually use Boolean simplification rules. We will see this later on with one bit adder. So we're actually going to simplify this, build a truth table, and then simplify this one bit adder. Again, not right now. And I'm, uh, this is one example. This is a sum of products form of one other function, some other function that we studied. You can actually write this in min terms, but I'm not going to do that, uh, like min term numbers, right? Um, and if you simplify it a little bit, you'll get this function. This is not the simplest form. Basically, you can get the simpler forms. OK, now let's cover some uh, combinational logic blocks. Uh, I spent a lot of time earlier, but hopefully you know Boolean algebra, and this is relatively easier. It's coming back. You'll need to do some exercise and study so that it comes back fully, let's say. Uh, now we're going to build some things that probably you have not seen. How many people have seen a decoder in the past? OK, I see some hands. If you've done the readings and seen a recorder, that doesn't count. You saw it in high school? How many people have seen a decoder in high school? OK, wow. How many people have not seen a decoder in high school? How many people do not remember? That's also OK. <laughs> OK, fine. But we're going to start with uh, actually a bunch of things. We've already known these. These are common logic gates. We're going to build uh, bigger blocks that consist of these logic gates so that we can build more complex systems. And once we build a bigger block, we can actually abstract as a module so that we don't see the gate level representation also. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of abstraction, basically. We can say this is a decoder. This is a, I don't know, four input decoder. And you don't see the underlying representation. So we're going to look at decoder, multiplexer, full adder, PLA, and then uh, a, couple, a few other stuff also. So let's see the decoder. I call this the input pattern detector. This is essentially a very simple pattern matcher, if you will. It has n inputs and two of the n outputs. And depending on the inputs, uh, the, the combination of the inputs that you get, only one of the outputs is 1. All of the other outputs is 0. And that output indicates that particular combination. That output actually uh, corresponds to that particular input combination. So if that output is 1, you know that the input combination is something. And we will see that something in a little bit. Basically, the output that is logically 1 is the output corresponding to the input pattern that the logic circuit is expected to detect. This is a mouthful, but let's take a look at a picture. 2 to 4 decoder. This is the truth table. It has two inputs, and it has four outputs. You can see, I mean, 0, 0. If inputs are both 0, output y0 is 1, everything else is 0. If inputs are 0, 1, output y1 is 1, all of the other outputs is 0. And you can keep basically doing what I just said. Basically, only one output corresponding to the input is 1, everything else is 0. This basically, this circuit detects uh, the input pattern because only one output corresponding to the pattern is 1. Makes sense, right? Okay, this is used in many places, uh, as we will see later. And now this is a modular representation. I can give you this module and say, this is a two to four decoder, two input, four output. A1, A0 are inputs, and Y3, Y0 are outputs. And that's the truth tape. Now, there, you can also realize this uh, with gates. And we're going to do that in the next slide. And this is the gate level, uh, simple represent. This is one way of building a decoder uh, using AND gates, as you can see over here. And you can simulate it with your head. So uh, basically, uh, this output is 1 if both A and B are 1. This output is 1 if A is 1 and B is 0. This output is 1 if A is 0, B is 1. And this output is 1 uh, if A and B are both zeros. So you can see that all of the combinations are enabled here, right? Uh, or represented here. So this is one example. If A is 1, B is 0, you get a 1 here and 0 over here. So basically, this is detecting the pattern 1, 0, if you will. This is detecting the pattern 0, 1. This is detecting the pattern 0, 0. Now I can generalize this to 8-bit, eight 8 input decoder. Then you will have 2 to the 8 uh, outputs, right? That's 64 outputs. 
Is that 64? No, that's not 64. That's 256 opts. Okay. So it's useful in deter uh, determining how to interpret a bit pattern. Uh, basically here, uh, because we know that this output is one, we know the input is one zero, the way the circuit is designed. So you can basically detect that this, this set of bits, this set of inputs uh, is corresponds to some value. So why is this useful? Because this could be the address of a memory location. So you may have a simple memory and the memory address is specified in two bits. And one zero means this is the address of this location. And this thing over here, this wire over here can be connected to that memory location that activates that location and you get the data out of that place. If you want to get the data out of memory location one one, you need to supply address one one over here and this gets activated one, it becomes one and this becomes zero. And this is hopefully connected to the data that's stored in location one one. Tomorrow we're gonna to build such memories and you will see that we're gonna use decoders to decode the address. So that's the beauty of decoder. Decoder is used uh, in many places where you need to know what the input pattern is. Okay, you will see more of this. Or this could be an instruction. So the inputs could be the address of a location. The input could be the, an instruction in the program and the processor needs to decide what action to take. So the input can specify the opcode as we will see later on. What is the instruction supposed to do? Is it an add, is it a multiply, is it an XOR, it's a shift, uh, is it a divide, is it a floating point multiply? Basically you have a bit pattern as the input that specifies the instruction. Every instruction corresponds to a bit pattern as we will see in later lectures in the instruction set architecture. Uh, for example, and corresponds to a four bit combination one zero one one. You get this four bit combination and you supply to a decoder four input to the, six, uh, to the four output. And the, uh, the end gate uh, that corresponds to one zero one one, I believe I, that's what I said, one zero one one gives you a one output. That one output tells you that, oh, now I'm dealing with an AND instruction, right? Or add instruction, whatever that instruction was. Basically different instructions can be distinguished based on their encodings. And those encodings are input to the decoder and the decoder, decoder basically asserts a signal that's corresponding to that instruction. Now I can use that information to decide the circuit that will execute the instruction as we will see. Does this make sense? So you need to detect patterns whenever you actually need to do things, access memory, decide what's an instruction, uh, decide what kind of instruction. And we will do this also. This is going to come soon, basically. We're going to have decoders used in uh, instruction execution logic, for example, later on. Okay. Everybody's happy with the decoder? Now, I'm, ju I'm just giving you the basic building blocks. Tomorrow, we're going to put some of these together to build sequential logic. We will need multiplexers and memories, for example. So multiplexer, it's also called a selector, actually, uh, selects one of the N inputs to connect it to the output. Now, that's also beautiful. Based on the value of a log two to the N bit control input called select. So you have two data inputs and one select input, and the output is selected based on the value of the select input. If the select input is zero, you pick one of the data inputs at the zero input, and if the select input is one, you pick the other data input. So that's a two to one max. The selection is important because you need to make decisions, right? Uh, let's take a look at how this is built. So two to the one max, this is the uh, truth table of the two to the one max. You can see that there are three inputs, one select input, one data, two data inputs. And you can see that if the select input is zero, Y is equal to the data input at zero, output is equal to data input at zero. If select input is one, Output is the same as data input one, okay? So you can actually simplify it. Or you can build this using sum of products form or product of sums form, but that will not be small. So this is the module level representation. Uh, yeah, two to one max as you can see, but it's not gate level. This is, this is a max sign basically. So let's take a look at the gate level representation, simplified gate level representation. It looks like this basically. A and B are inputs and select is supplied to these. Uh, and uh, if select is zero, this small a passes a. Uh, if select is zero, this b becomes zero, right? And then uh, large a ended with zero is a, so c is a if select is zero. If select is one, 
uh, B, B is passed and C is equal to B basically. Okay, I've already done one example of this. If select is zero, A get passed basically. Okay, now you, you can build logic gates like this uh, or, or more complex logic structure like this. So the output C is always connected to either the input A or input B. Output value depends on the value of the select line in this case. So usually uh, this is called a control input. Select input is called a control input. It's still an input to the gate, but control inputs are usually marked as white arrows like this to distinguish them from data inputs, as we will see when we build a simple processor. So A and B are data inputs, C is another data input. Here, S is used as a control input, control signal. You can also specify the truth table. You can mess with the truth table a little bit. This is not the standard form of a truth table uh, because standard form requires ones and zeros, right? Uh, but this is also a truth table. You can see that if S is zero, C is A. If S is one, C is B. It's a messed up truth table because the inputs are not on the left, right? In a like canonical truth table, inputs should be on the left. But this is also a cute way of expressing the truth table, if you will. So, okay, if your task was to draw the schematic for a four input, four to one max, uh, at the gate level, it's going to be easy because I'm going to do that in the next slide. Uh, and you can also draw this at the module level. So basically you can, you can do this at the gate level using ands and ors, or you can uh, do it at the module level as a combination of two input, uh, two, uh, multiple two input maxes, two to one maxes. And this is the module level representation over here. Basically, this is a two to one max, this is a two to one max, and this is another two to one max. And these are the two select inputs because you need to do four to one max. You need to select out of four items, one item. You need two inputs, right, as your select inputs. And you can convince yourself that this will actually uh, implement the truth table that we just shown over here. I'll, I'll not do that. And this is the gate level representation, which is basically an expanded version of what we just saw over here with the two to one max. So instead of two to one max, we have a four to one max in the gate level representation. Okay. So basically, uh, for example, uh, the, the output uh, will select D0 if uh, both. Uh, S1 and S0 are zeros. And you can convince yourself that the right things are connected. If S1 and S0 are both ones, the output uh, will select uh, the value of uh, Y is equal to D3, basically. Okay, any questions? So multiplexers are good for selecting uh, bits. As we will see tomorrow in memories, we will multiplex out or select some bits from memory to read. We will decode the address and multiplex the bits that we're going to read because we, need to, we want to uh, get the bits that correspond to that address, for example. Or multiplexers are good for selecting the logic. For example, when you build a microprocessor, you're going to implement a multiply function and an add function. Uh, which instruction will use which one depends on the opcode, encoding of the instruction. Now you decode the instruction using a decoder, end-to-one decoder. That gives you a signal. Now that signal will be used to select uh, uh, one um, uh, essentially uses a select input for a multiplexer, and the multiplexer can select from the result of the multiplier or adder. And if the instruction you're executing is a multiply, then that select input that's coming from the output of the decoder will select the multiplication unit uh, as the data input uh, from the MUX. So I can combine decoders and multiplexers, as you can see, to build bigger logic. Okay. No questions, so I'll continue. So you can actually do very funky things with the multiplexers. You can actually do logic using multiplexers. I should really talk about this because FPGAs actually do some of this, if you will. You can actually use multiplexers as lookup tables to perform logic functions. Let's take a look at how we do this. This is out of your book. You can see that this is a simple AND function, right? You can use an AND gate, or you could use a multiplexer. So this is the multiplexer. What does this multiplexer do? Based on the values of A and B, it's a four to one multiplexer. Based on the values of A and B, uh, it decides Y. And the values of A and B that lead to zero, those input combinations of the multiplexer are tied to zero, which is ground. And the value that leads to one is tied to power, high voltage. So this multiplexer will select Y is equal to one, Y, y to be one, only if A and B both are one. Right. If, if for everything else, y is equal to zero because zero will pass. That sounds beautiful, right? This is called a lookup table, actually. 
Uh, another way of doing this is a little bit simpler. You can actually simplify this to be a two to one multiplexer, as you can see, uh, by realizing that y is equal to zero if a is zero, y is equal to b if a is one. You can simplify this yourself, think about it. Uh, and basically design a multiplexer that looks like this. B is the input, uh, data input one of the multiplexer, and zero is data input zero. And if A is zero, you get zero. If A is one, you get B, okay? This is a simpler form of multiplexer, simpler lookup table that corresponds to exactly the same function. Okay, this is another function. This is the XOR function, actually. A XOR B can be implemented using a multiplexer. And it could be actually cheaper than an XOR implementation directly, potentially, depending on how your design is. Uh, but basically, if A is equal to zero, you select B. If A is equal to one, you select B bar. And you can actually do this by doing the simplification, by realizing in this truth table that uh, the Y output uh, is equal to B if the A output is A, uh, A, uh, the Y output is equal to B if A is zero. The Y output is B's complement if A is one, right? That's again, basic logic over here. By looking at the truth table, you can do this. And you can do more complicated things. Uh, this is not a function that uh, anybody easily recognizes clearly, but it's a truth table. And you can have an eight to one multiplexer because this function has three inputs. And basically tie the zero inputs uh, or zero outputs, uh, uh, tie the inputs corresponding to zeros to zero, as you can see, as we have done over here, that's four inputs over here, four input combinations. Uh, sorry, zeros, zeros are these. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, uh, one, one, zero, one, 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 they're all zeros. They're tied to zeros and everything else is tied to uh, power, which is one. So Y will evaluate to one if those four input combinations that are tied to one uh, happens, if any of those happens. So again, this is a lookup table because you kind of program the lookup table this way. Uh, okay, another way of looking at this is, this is a three bit uh, input lookup table, three lots. It's essentially the same as what I showed you earlier, but you can think of this as inputs. Uh, multiplexer chooses one of the eight data inputs that corresponds to the three bit select input. So there's a select input, this is a select input. And these are, you can think of these as the data inputs. Uh, and basically you program what values should be stored over here. If the input combination is zero, 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 what should the function output, basically? You can think of it that way. A three lot can implement any three bit input function. And there's a correspondence uh, between what we've discussed so far earlier. So this is a, a, an example of programming a LUT. So basically, FPGAs are composed of lookup tables like this. FPGAs are very heavily programmable. Uh, in some cases, they implement circuits using lookup tables. If you have a function, for example, you can program the FPGA, a bunch of MUXs, a bunch of multiplexers, and that FPGA implements the function that you program it with. So if the function looks like this earlier, what I showed you, uh, uh, but basically this is the function. Uh, a function that outputs one when there are at least two ones in a three bit input. Uh, these are the C level implementations. Don't look at that. This is a hardware implementation, basically. Hardware implementation is a multiplexer, and the multiplexer looks this way eight to one, multi uh, eight to one multiplexer, yes, because we have a three input function. That's two to the three combinations. And these are the different combinations corresponding to different data inputs of the multiplexer. And you want to set the data inputs to one only for those cases where at least two of the inputs is ones. What are those cases? Here you have two of the inputs ones. Here you have two of the inputs ones. Here you have at least two of the inputs ones. And here also you have at least two of the inputs ones. Everything else, there is exactly one or zero inputs as ones. So you can see that this function will return one if the select input corresponds to an input combination that is at least two ones in it. So we did not build logic. Well, we kind of use the multiplexer uh, to build logic by using a lookup table, right? We did not build a specialized logic to do this task that we are given at the top, which is find, uh, design a circuit that implements, uh, uh, that outputs one if at least two of the inputs uh, is one. We did not do that. We basically programmed the multiplexer. That's how FPGAs operate. And we will talk about that also. So you can also do logic using decoders. By the way, any questions so far? Hopefully people find this fascinating. Is this fascinating? Okay, good. Now you're seeing how complicated reconfigurable logic is implemented. 
This way, you don't need to implement specialized logic. You can reconfigure things, right? Uh, OK. Decoders can also be combined with OR gates to build logic functions, because decoders actually supply you min terms. So that's a two to four decoder. If you have a two input function, in this case, XNOR, for example, uh, you have a bunch of min terms, because decoder, uh, essentially, decoder, a decoder output is one when that pattern is detected, right? A X nor B is one if A B is true or A bar B bar is true. Basically, this is the X nor implementation. You need to uh, basically uh, find the input combinations that make this function a one, and then you need to have an OR gate. Now, this looks very much like a sum of products form, right? It's actually the sum of products form. So, because the decoder generates the min terms. If you hadn't realized that, now you can realize that. A decoder really generates the min terms of a function. Okay. So basically, uh, that what it, whatever we talked about, sum of products form, products of some forms actually can be used to program things like this, a programmable logic array, or multiplexers, if you think a little bit further. Okay, let's talk about a full adder. Let's do some addition. So binary addition is interesting. Basically, it's like decimal addition, except <clears throat> uh, uh, you have a single bit you're dealing with. It's not decimal, it's uh, binary, right? You go from right to left, one column at a time, you get one sum and one carry bit. So basically, this is a sum bit, A0 plus B0, and then there's a carry out that's generated. And then you add A1, B1, and carry out. And then again, in the binary domain, you generate a sum one bit and then carry out. So you propagate the carry, and that's carry is included over here. You can think of this carry zero as zero to begin with, unless you're doing a longer addition and there's a carry that comes from there, but we're not going to talk about that now. So this is a truth table of binary addition on one column of bits within uh, two n-bit operands. So basically AI, BI, carry I, uh, and uh, you get carry I plus one and then sum. This is a single bit addition, basically. That's called a full adder, that's why. There's also a half adder, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, half adder doesn't include the carry, basically. Uh, but ba if you look at this, uh, you can you can create this truth table. Uh, if all of these are zero, sum is zero, there's no carry out. Let's look at a more interesting case. If A is one, B is one, and carry is zero, the sum should be zero in binary because one plus one is zero in binary. We're thinking about base two. But you generate a carry because you overflew the binary, right? As a result, you get uh, one carry out over here. And one, one, one leads to one, one over here in the carry and sum. Okay, now you can build this using sum of products form. And this is a perfectly fine full adder. This is the sum of product form. You can do it yourself. You can see that there are eight AND gates. And then for two outputs, two OR gates, and we collected the correct combinations that lead to a one output, correct min terms, if you will, that lead to a one output uh, for the carry and sum. And this is a decoder. This is a three to eight decoder. I can actually... Uh, abstract that away with a decoder. Okay, this is a full adder. We're going to simplify that later, but you're going to see that this is a majority function and this is an XOR function, which is beautiful. Both of these are beautiful functions. So how do you build a four-bit adder? Now let's talk about the module level. We're going to simplify this later. Uh, so you can create a four-bit adder out of one full, one bit full adders to add two four-bit binary numbers. And this is your four-bit adder, basically. This is a full adder, each bit, the zeroth bit of A and B, and you get a carry, and then you get the sum. And then that's the first bit of A and B. Uh, I should probably use this. And then you get a carry out from there. And then this is ter uh, second bit, bit two. And this is the third bit. And then you get a carry out. So basically, you can do four bits addition in parallel, except carry is serialized, as you can see. Because you need the carry uh, to do the addition for the next bit. Right? Initially, the carry is zero, as I said. OK, so that's beautiful. Now we are combining circuits, right? And this is a 30, 30, This is called a ripple carry adder because you're really rippling the carry bit. There are many, many adder designs that people have proposed. We're not going to go into them. I'm going to uh, flash one of them in a little bit. Uh, but this is a perfectly fine adder, except it takes a long time for the carry to propagate from the left to the right. So if you really want to optimize the addition uh, for uh, latency, this is probably not the way you should build the adder. You can start with a truth table of 32 bits, right? 32 inputs. Uh, 32 outputs, uh, and then you can actually try to minimize that truth table. That's probably expensive. But people have come up with a lot of creative ideas. This is an example where you do the carry generation separately from addition. Carry generation operates using four bits, and you actually kind of predict what the carry would be. It's a speculative way of doing 
query generation. But this is an example of logic specialization. I'm not going to hold you responsible for this. Your book covers this briefly if you want to take a look at it. But basically, you can specialize the logic for query generation to make the adder faster. Again, this is not the state of the art also, but this is a good idea that people have used. OK, let's talk about programmable logic array. So programmable logic array essentially is a way of configuring circuits such that they are in sum of product form. So sum of product form leads to two-level logic. It's not, as we said, uh, uh, minimal. But the PLA, a programmable logic array, enables a two-level SOP implementation of any N input, M output function. So let's take a look at this. So this is, again, the decoder, if you will, all of the min terms. And you basically make the connections, configurable connections, such that you connect the right min terms so that you implement functions x, y, z. So there's kind of magic over here, but they're muxes, actually. These are actually multiplexers or fuses. We're not going to go into the details of how it's done exactly. But this is a very common logic structure for implementing any collection of logic functions that one wishes to, because it obeys the sum of products form. So it's an array of AND gates followed by an array of OR gates. And the AND gates are very special in the sense that they form the min terms of the N input function, which means that, that that's a decoder, basically, as we discussed, right? So how do you determine the number of AND gates? Now that you know the sum of product form, that's, this is the minimum, the number of possible min terms. This is the two to the number of N, essentially. For an M input function, you need a PLA with two to the N, N input AND gates. How do you determine the number of OR gates? That's essentially the number of output bits. So if the function has one output bit, only one of these is enough. But if the function has 20, you need 20 of these so that you can connect any of the min terms uh, that implement those different bits, if you will, uh, output bits. So how do you implement logic function? Let's take a look at this. You connect the output of an AND gate to the input of an OR gate if the corresponding min term is included in the sum of products. You've already seen this. So it's basically not magic. And you can make this programmable. So programming a PLA means that we program the connections from the AND gate outputs to the OR gate inputs to implement a desired logic function, just like we did using logic using decoders earlier. That was actually a PLA. What I called logic using decoders was a programmable logic array. In that particular case, it's a two, two input function, right? So actually, I've already shown you and lookup tables, which is also programmable logic. So lookup tables and programmable logic arrays are actually programmable logic employed in FPGAs today. And also more sophisticated forms are employed in FPGAs. OK, so let's take a look at this PLA very quickly. Basically, you can also think about this as an AND array and an OR array, inputs, M inputs, and then you get the min terms or implicants. And then you basically do the connections uh, such that you get the uh, outputs. So this is one example. Uh, actually, maybe this is a better example. So basically, uh, th in this particular case, this is output uh, requires A bar, B bar, C. And this requires AB bar. I mean, this is not an exactly a PLA, actually, uh, but uh, you can think of this as a PLA also. But let's, take, let's implement a full adder using a PLA. I want to actually go to this example. So this was our PLA. How do we implement a full adder with this? So let's take a look at the truth table of a full adder. This is what we constructed earlier. Basically, you need to make sure that cherry includes the min terms. What, is, what are the min terms? 0, 1, 2. It, it should include 3. Five, six, seven. So min terms, the AND gates that are generating the min terms, three, five, six, seven should get connected to carry I plus one. And I hope that's the case over here. I didn't verify it, but you can take a look. SI should be including min terms that are one, two, five, uh, and eight. Maybe, maybe I did something wrong earlier. This is seven. What did I do? Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, one, two, four, and seven. So SI should have one, two, four, and seven. Okay. So basically, uh, hopefully, these are implemented correctly. And I can see that they're implemented correctly, actually. Uh, you connect the outputs of the AND gates that correspond to min terms that should be included in the carry versus sum. And this output is not used because a full adder only requires two outputs, right? So this input is not connected to any of the outputs because for none of the outputs, an input of the min term 0 is used, as you can see. Min term 0 is always zero, uh, leads to a zero output uh, for any of the outputs. And we do not need this output because, as I just already said, we need two outputs. OK, so hopefully this is clear. And it's also fascinating. <laughs> so now you've seen two types of programmable logic, multiplexer-based lookup tables and uh, decoder plus OR gate-based uh, uh, 
programmable logic arrays. Now, I did not show you what's inside here and how do you program this. There are multiple methods for doing that. Multiplexer is an, ex an example, uh, but also uh, you could also have fuses, which we're not going to talk about in this course, but you can read the uh, book that, uh, that talks about this. Okay, this is where we'll stop. Tomorrow actually is a good place to start logical completeness, and we're going to jump into sequential logic. Uh, see you all tomorrow.